Welcome to the Ultimate Sports Blog Podcast. Today is Monday, August 20th, 2018. I'm back after a two-day hiatus from the weekend. Today I'm going to recap yesterday's baseball games, look ahead to tonight's games, go over my weekly power rankings and players of the week, go over all the NFL preseason action from the weekend, a big-name running back signs with the Redskins, We'll go over the college football AP poll that came out a couple hours ago, and I'm going to do a new fun activity on the podcast that I'm going to kick off today that I'm going to do for the college and NFL football seasons. All right, let's go over the baseball. The Yankees defeated the Blue Jays 10-2. to They complete the sweep. Jay Happ improves to 14-6 and on the season. 4-0 as a member of the Yankees. Ryan Barocchi drops to 2-3. and three. The Rays defeat the Red Sox 2-0 to avoid a sweep as they improve to 63-61. Boston drops to 88-37. Jalen Beeks improves to 2-1. Hector Velasquez drops to 7-1. Sergio Romo gets his 16th save of the season. The Indians defeated the Orioles 8-0 to take the rubber game of that series. They improve to 71-52. Baltimore drops to 37-87. Mike Clevenger improves to 9-7. Jeffrey Ramirez drops to 1-5. The Reds defeat the Giants 11-4 to complete the sweep as they improve to 55-69. San Fran drops to 61-64. Luis Castillo improves to 7-10. Andrew Suarez drops to 4-9. The Rockies defeat the Braves 4-2 to complete the sweep as they improve to 68-56. Atlanta drops to 68-55. Herman Marquez improves to 11-9. Anibal Sanchez drops to 6-4. Wade Davis gets his 35th save of the season. The Marlins defeated the Nationals 12-1 as they improved the 50 and 76. The Nats dropped the 62 and 63. Jose Arena improves the 4 and 12 in his first game back from his suspension. Gio Gonzalez drops to 7 and 10. The Pirates defeated the Cubs 2-1 in 11 innings on a walk-off homer by Adam Frazier. The Pirates improved to 63 and 62. The Cubs dropped to 71 and 52. The Pirates get the split in this four-game set. Richard Rodriguez improves to 3-2. and two. Brandon Kinsler drops to 1-3. and three. The White Sox defeat the Royals 7-6 to complete 2 out of 3 from the Royals as the White Sox improve the 46-77. and 77. The Royals drop to 38-86. and 86. Hector Santiago improves to 5-3. and three. Brian Flynn drops to 3-4. and four. Jace Fry gets his second save of the season. The Twins defeat the Tigers 5-4. As they improved to 59 and 64, the Tigers dropped to 51 and 74. Trevor Hildenberger improves to 3 and 3. Alex Wilson drops to 1 and 4. The Brewers defeat the Cardinals 2 to 1 to salvage the final game of this series. As they improved to 69 and 57, the Cardinals dropped to 68 and 57. Julius Cassini improves to 13 and 4. John Gant drops to 5 and 5. Josh Hader gets his 10th save of the season. The Rangers defeat the Angels 4 to 2. As they take three out of four, they improve to 56 and 70. The Angels drop to 63 and 63. Matt Moore improves to three and six. Noe Ramirez drops to two and two. Jose Lickrec gets his fifth save of the season. The Astros defeat the Athletics nine to four to complete, or I should say, to avoid a sweep, not to complete a sweep, or else they would have been up three games in that division. As Astros improve to. 75 and 49. The Oakland Athletics dropped to 74 and 50. Justin Verlander improves to 12 and 8 and also gets his 200th career victory. Sean Mania drops to 11 and 9. Houston is up one game in that division. The Dodgers defeated the Mariners 12 to 1 as they improve to 67 and 58. Seattle drops to 71 and 54. Clayton Kershaw improves to 6 and 5. Robbie Elias drops to 2-1. and one. Kershaw's pitched very well in his last couple starts. The Diamondbacks feed the Padres 4-3 to three on a go-ahead home run in the ninth inning by A.J. Pollock. Arizona completes 2 out of 3 as they improve to 69-58 as the Padres drop to 49-78. and 78. Archie Bradley improves to 4-4. Four four. Kirby H. drops to 4-2. and two. Brad Boxberger gets his 28th save of the season. And from Williamsport, Pennsylvania... In the Little League Classic, the Mets defeat the Phillies 8-2 as they improved to 54-69. and The Phillies dropped to 68-56. and Jason Vargas improves to 3-8. and Nick Pavetta drops to 7-10. and 
Tonight's games, you don't have a lot. There's a lot of teams traveling today. Orioles at the Blue Jays. Andrew Kashner and Marco Estrada. Braves at the Pirates. Kevin Gossman and Chris Archer. Indians at the Red Sox. Corey Kluber and Rick Porcello. That's going to be a fun game. I believe MLB Network is airing that game. And that's going to be a fun series as well. Big one for Boston. Big win for Cleveland to prove themselves, and that's a nice pitching matchup. Porcello pitches very well at Fenway Park, and he is not very good on the road. Corey Kluber has not pitched well of late. He's kind of dropped out of the Cy Young race, but not as far out as, say, New York Yankees ace Luis Severino, who's been a slump since the beginning of July. But I wouldn't say Corey Kluber's in the top two right now for the American League Cy Young. I'd say the top two for that are Chris Sale and Justin Verlander. Although Verlander has not pitched well of late, giving up a lot of home runs lately. White Sox Twins also at 7 o'clock. You have Lucas Giolito and making his big league debut, Steven Gonzalez. You have the Giants and the Mets from City Field. Derek Holland and Zach Wheeler at the... Under the radar, nice pitching matchup. Wheeler's pitched very well since the trade deadline. You have the Royals and the Rays. Jorge Lopez making his second start as a Royal against Hunter Wood, who will be tonight's opener. Reds Brewers at 8 o'clock. Homer Bailey and Chase Anderson. You have the Rangers and the Athletics. Bartolo Colon and Mike Fires. Astros Mariners also at 10 o'clock. Garrett Cole and Felix Hernandez. Hernandez back in the rotation after the injury to James Paxton. And a very nice series between the Cardinals and the Dodgers. Austin Gomber and Alex Wood. A big series for both of these teams. Both of these teams in the National League pennant race. The Cardinals turnaround has been absolutely remarkable. I believe both of these teams, when said and done, will be in the playoffs as of Right now, if I had to bet, I'd say both of these teams will get in. I do believe the Dodgers will overtake the Rockies and the Diamondbacks and win the West. Cardinals, I believe. I'm going to go this far. I think they'll host the National League Wild Card game. I think Bush Stadium will be the host of the National League Wild Card game. And I think we all know that Yankee Stadium will be the host of the American League Wild Card game. Power rankings for the week. Every week I go from 30 to 1, as you all know by now. 30s, the Baltimore Orioles are just the worst team in baseball. And I'm interested to see if they sell off pieces like Adam Jones at the waiver deadline. 29s, the Kansas City Royals, same thing. Second worst team in baseball. I wonder if they'll let some of their players go on the waiver wire within the next couple of days, weeks. It's 11 days, believe it or not, until the waiver deadline, which is August 31st. I'll get more into that within the next 11 days on the podcast as well as September call-ups and which ones I think can have impacts on their teams and especially in the pennant races because it's always fun to see a September call-up have an impact on a pennant race. 28 is the Chicago White Sox. They're playing a little bit better of late but they're still not a good baseball team. 28 is the Detroit Tigers. Same thing. A little better of late. Not a good baseball team. There are another two teams to keep an eye on on the waiver deadline, whether it's Jose Abreu, Nicholas Castellanos, or one of those guys the surprise name moved in waivers, potentially. That's remained to be seen. 26 is the San Diego Padres. Do they move Kirby Yates at the waiver move deadline? Could the Dodgers somebody use him? Maybe St. Louis Would be an interesting landing spot as well. 25 is the Miami Marlins. They already shifted Justin Bohr to Philadelphia as a waiver deadline move. Will they move JT Romuto? Probably not. They'll probably wait until the offseason when there could be more contenders going to try to get them if the Nationals are still or decide to still be a contender in a potential post Bryce Harper era. Will they go and get JT Romuto? We'll talk about JT Romuto more within the next 11 days and see what rumors pop up about him potentially moving, but I doubt it. I think he'll be moved in December. 24 is the New York Mets. They've 
been displaying themselves good offensive baseball lately. They put up 24 runs in Philadelphia. They put up, I believe, 18 runs in Baltimore. They scored some runs at Yankee Stadium. I think they're just happy to be playing the Yankees in that game. But, hey, I have to give the Mets some credit. They're playing well right now. I believe they had a winning week. They won three games in Philadelphia or against the Phillies. I should say one of them was in Williamsport, the other two in Philadelphia. They won a game in Baltimore and they won a game in New York. So that's five wins for the Mets this week. That's why they're out of the bottom five. Jason Vargas is pitching a little bit better. But still, this team is not very good. And they're another possible team that could move some people on the waiver wire. Jose Batista, can he help an Al contender like the Yankees or Cleveland potentially off the bench? 23 is the Toronto Blue Jays. Keep an eye on Josh Donaldson. When will he return? And it, will he be a name that will be moved in 11 days? 22 is the Cincinnati Reds. They swept the Giants, which kept them out of the bottom 5-2. I don't think they'll move many pieces within the next 11 days. If anything, maybe Matt Harvey. 21, Texas Rangers. They actually have been playing good baseball lately. Won 3 out of 4 from the Angels over the weekend. They are actually hitting the ball very well. Rugnan Odor has been hot of late. They have a nice young core, and I won't be shocked if they're a buyer in the offseason and try to be a contender in the 2019 season instead of rebuilding. But who knows, maybe they'll move some pieces at the waiver wire deadline too. 20s, the Minnesota Twins. They're just playing out the string right now, pretty much. Eddie Rosario's hit well for them. Miguel Sano is starting to get it back a little bit. I wonder if Byron Buxton... We'll be back before the end of the season. Number 19 is the San Francisco Giants. They were just swept in Cincinnati. I wonder if they'll move pieces. They'll turn into a seller at the waiver deadline and possibly move somebody like an Andrew McCutcheon. I do not think Ma Madison Bumgarner will be moved. That would be a monster surprise, even a bigger surprise than Justin Verlander being moved last year, in my opinion. If anything, if the Giants decide to do a full-blown-on rebuild, They'll do what the Marlins did last December and trade everybody at the winter meetings because there'll be more contenders involved. Maybe the Mets will try to go out and make a move for, like, say, a Brandon Belt unless they think Peter Alonzo's ready next year, which I think they like Peter Alonzo. Maybe they're out on Brandon Belt. Maybe the Yankees would be interested in Brandon Belt if they decide to move on from Greg Bird. They'll certainly be interested in Madison Bumgarner in the offseason. I predicted before the year that the Giants would be bad and that they would have a major sell-off and that Bumgarner would end up in pinstripes. But that was a whiff on me, but maybe in the offseason. You just never know. 18, the Los Angeles Angels. They obviously might trade some guys away on the waiver deadline. Maybe Camba Rotian or Blaine Parker. Maybe Jose Alvarez, Noe Ramirez, they have some relievers that can help some contenders. 17 is the Washington Nationals, they've fallen out of it. Daniel Murphy's was placed on waivers. I mentioned the Indians and the Yankees as teams that Jose Batista would fit nicely on. I think Murphy would be a great addition to either of those teams, especially Cleveland, because I think New York has to focus on outfield because Aaron Judge had yet another setback. Maybe Batista would work in Yankee Stadium with that short porch with the right-handed bat and that lineup. I think he'd work in New York, and I think Daniel Murphy would be better fitted in Cleveland to play second base for them and move Jason Kipnis to the outfield. 16 is the Pittsburgh Pirates. They've fallen out of it a little bit. I wonder if they'll pivot to sell mode. After trading for Chris Archer, I know they won't trade Chris Archer again. They'll keep him. Number 15 is the Tampa Bay Rays. They've played a lot better baseball of late. They've won two out of three in Yankee Stadium. Salvaged the final game in Boston against the Red Sox. So they had a nice 3-3 three and three week against two of the contenders. 14 is the Seattle Mariners. They 
really have hit a wall a little bit. They lost bad yesterday to the Dodgers. They went on a walk-off balk on Saturday, which I thought was comical and very fitting of the Dodgers to lose like that. James Paxton's hurt. That's probably a factor why I put the Mariners this low. 13-12 and 12 are your two leading contenders for the NL East crown in Philadelphia and Atlanta, respectively. Philadelphia's 13. I don't think they had a good week. They gave up 24 to the Mets on Thursday. Although they rebounded and won on Thursday night in that second game of that doubleheader. They split with the Red Sox. They could have swept Boston if they came through in the 8th and ninth innings against the Red Sox bullpen. Reese Hoskins has been pretty good of late for Philly. I think Justin Bohr will prove to be a good pickup. Wilson Ramos just came back for them. I think he'll be an impact back for them. Atlanta, Ronald Acuna had a phenomenal week. All those home runs. And then unfortunately the incident with Jose Arena when Arena plunked Acuna, which led to the suspension. Number 11 is the Los Angeles Dodgers. Their bullpen woes against San Francisco and Seattle kept them out of the top 10. Although they rebounded nicely yesterday and won big over Seattle. 10 is the Milwaukee Brewers. They've been a little up and down of late. They split with the Cubs at Wrigley. Lost 2 out of 3 in St. Louis against the Cardinals. Number 9 is the Colorado Rockies. They had a great week. They swept Atlanta which was very impressive in a four-game set in Atlanta, too. I think Colorado can make the playoffs. Number eight is Arizona. They've been playing pretty well lately. Zach Greinke has been pitching pretty well, with the exception of that game in Texas. I don't think Greinke pitched his best in that game. Seven is the St. Louis Cardinals, who've been on an absolute tear of late. Matt Carpenter. Might be your favorite for the National League MVP right now, along with Javier Baez, Paul Goldschmidt, Nolan Arenado, Freddie Freeman. There's a lot of guys in that conversation. I think that's the most wide-open award race in the sport right now. Although I think AL MVP is getting a little interesting with Jose Ramirez making a case. And I'm going to discuss another Dark Horse American League MVP candidate once I get to his respective team. But Matt Carpenter, I think, has put himself to be at least a top five candidate for the National League MVP, along with Baez, Arenado, Freeman, and Goldschmidt. Six is the Cleveland Indians. I already mentioned Jose Ramirez in a possible AL MVP campaign. His teammate, Francisco Lindor, is in that conversation as well. The Indians have been quietly been playing very well right now. Big series for them this week at Fenway Park. We'll talk about it more as the days go on the podcast. Five is the Chicago Cubs. They split with Milwaukee and then they split with Pittsburgh. So a three and three week. Not the greatest thing in the world, but the Cubs are still a very good team. And I think they'll win the National League Central. Four is the Houston Astros. They avoided disaster yesterday by winning in Oakland to avoid a sweep. And speaking of Oakland, they're number three. They deserve the spot. Yes, they didn't sweep Houston. But they have to be satisfied with how the weekend went for them. They were in a first place tie going into yesterday's action. Give Houston credit. They won the game. And Oakland, I think, has to be proud of themselves of how they played in that series. They had the walk-off home run by Matt Olson on Friday night. They won big on Saturday and roughed up Dallas Keuchel. They even got the Verlander a little bit yesterday, but Oakland... Just didn't get the job done. Sean Mania had a rough outing as well. Number two is the New York Yankees. They went four and three this week. Lost the game to the Mets. Lost two out of three to Tampa. And then swept Toronto. That was a good sweep by the Yanks. They pretty much own Toronto at Yankee Stadium. They've owned Toronto this year, period. End of story. Dark Horse AL MVP candidate Giancarlo Stanton. What a turnaround for him. He was being booed at Yankee Stadium in April and even in May and even in the beginning of June. But he absolutely has turned his season around. And with the absence of Aaron Judge in that lineup, he stepped up his game big time. And his average has been creeping up and up and up towards 300. I believe he's hitting like 288 right now. And 
he absolutely has to be in the conversation along with the two stars on, in, the, on the Indians and with Martinez and Betts in Boston. And that, to me, is your top five right now. And obviously Aaron Judge is out of it because of his injury. And number one is the Boston Red Sox. I already talked about your two LMVP candidates. They have the slam dunk Cy Young favorite right now in Chris Sale in the American League, who unfortunately is on the disabled list right now due to more shoulder soreness. I think that is a loss for the Red Sox, though. Although their rotation did a nice job while he was out the first time around. He only missed, I believe, two starts. One was supposed to be against the Yankees, and the other one was supposed to be against Toronto. We'll see how long he misses this time around. And speaking of injuries, Didi Gregorius is very likely to head to the disabled list due to a heel bruise. Aaron Boone says that there's a pretty significant chance that he's on the disabled list. I believe he'll go to the DL. And that would be such an enormous loss for the Yankees. Although... Give the Yankees credit. They pretty much won without Didi Gregorius yesterday. They've pretty much been winning without Aaron Judge and Gary Sanchez and Didi Gregorius. Well, without Judge and Sanchez over the last couple weeks. Other than that Red Sox series and other than that Rays series, they've been taking care of everybody else. Yes, you got to take advantage of bad teams on your schedule. The Yankees have done that just fine. Although... The Rays, you can't call them a bad team because they're over 500 and have good starting pitching and have the good opener rotation. I think all those openers are actually pretty solid. Maybe not Hunter Wood, but I don't mind Ryan Stanek and Ryan Yarbrough. And, and even Wilmer Font has shown some promise too. And, and Jalen Beeks has had an impact and has been striking out guys left and right. Beeks, I think... That trade might go down as a win for Tampa Bay. And not that it hasn't been a bad trade for Boston yet, but Evaldi has done a nice job with the exception of that bad start in Baltimore. But I think the Red Sox can regret trading Jalen Beeks down the road. He's been unbelievable for Tampa Bay. Came in in relief of Hunter Wood in that Yankees game where the lone game the Yankees won in that game. He did a nice job in that game. And then he... Again, did a nice job against the Red Sox. Shut them down as well. But yeah, the Boston Red Sox are certainly deserving of the number one spot and will probably be at the number one spot for the rest of the season. Barring a six-game losing streak or barring a combination of a bad stretch for the Red Sox and an unbelievable run by Oakland, New York, Houston, or even the Cubs or Cleveland, for that matter, or... or you could talk me into the Dodgers going on a monster run or somebody like that. I don't see Philadelphia or Atlanta going on a big run. But you can even talk me into the Cardinals if they were to continue on a roll. And it has to be a combination of one of those teams and a Boston uh, regression in order for the Red Sox to not have that number one spot in the power rankings. Players of the week. American League is going to go with the American League Rookie of the Year favorite right now, which is Miguel Andujar of the New York Yankees. He's been on fire, hitting a lot of home runs, a lot of big home runs recently. Hit a couple homers against Tampa, a couple homers against Toronto as well. National League gets a slam dunk. Ronald Acuna, despite the injury, he's deserving of the National League Player of the Week. Hitting leadoff home run after leadoff home run. The kid is special, and he's going to win the National League Rookie of the Year over Juan Soto. NFL preseason action from the weekend. I went over Thursday's games on Friday's podcast, so I'm just going to do Friday's games and Saturday's games. The Giants defeated the Lions 30-17. to The Giants sat their regulars. Davis Webb got the start at quarterback. 14 for 20 with 120 yards and a touchdown. A nice bounce back game for him after a terrible outing against the Browns. Davis Webb competing for the backup quarterback job for the Giants with draft pick Kyle Loletta. Jake Rudock, 23 for 30, 171 yards and a touchdown. He'll probably be the backup to Matthew Stafford, who didn't see much action. Only went 2 for 5 at 51 yards. The veteran Matt Castle, 6 for 9 and 42 yards and an interception. 
The Chiefs defeated the Falcons 28-14. Patrick Mahomes did a nice job. 8 for 12, 138 yards, a touchdown and a pick. Had a good rating, 98.6. Chad Honey, the backup, 8 for 10, 85 yards and a touchdown. Matt Ryan, 5 for 7, 90 yards and a touchdown. Nice bounce back effort for him. And it had a very good rating of 153.3. Matt Schaub, the backup, 7 for 10, 75 yards and a touchdown. The Bills defeated the Browns 19 to 17. A.J. McCarron's the big story of this game. He hurt his shoulder. They're saying he broke his collarbone. He might be out for a while. So that leaves Nate Peterman and Josh Allen in play to start. Their opener in Baltimore against the Ravens. McCarron's 3 for 6, 12 yards. Nate Peterman, 8 for 10, 113 yards and a touchdown. Josh Allen, 9 for 13, 60 yards and a touchdown. Baker Mayfield, 7 for 13, 75 yards. Tyrod Taylor, 22 yards, 4 for 7. The Panthers defeat the Dolphins, 27 to 20. Cam Newton, 9 for 12, 89 yards, a touchdown and a pick. Ryan Tannehill, 14 for 17 and 100 yards. The Cardinals defeat the Saints, 20 to 15. Josh Rosen, much better game. 10 for 16, 107 yards and a touchdown. Sam Bradford, 6 for 6 and 61 yards. Taysom Hill got the start for New Orleans. 11 for 15, 68 yards and two picks. Tom Savage, 6 for 7 with 53 yards. JT Barrett, the former quarterback of Ohio State, 3 for 5 and 45 yards. Saturday's games. The Jaguars defeat the Vikings 14 to 10. A rough go for Blake Bortles, 12 for 20, 159 yards and a pick. Cody Kessler, 11 for 16 and 72 yards. Kirk Cousins, 3 for 8, 12 yards, so not a good day for him either. Trevor Simeon, 5 for 10, 46 yards. The Rams defeat the Raiders, 19 to 15. Sean Mannion, 10 for 16 with 84 yards. Brandon Allen, 6 for 11, 68 yards and then pick. EJ Manuel, 10 for 16, 89 yards and a touchdown. Connor Cook, 6 for 12, 49 yards. The Bengals defeat the Cowboys, 21 to 13. Dak Prescott looked good. 10 for 15, 86 yards, and a touchdown. Andy Dalton, 5 for 7, 47 yards. The Texans defeat the 49ers, 16 to 13. Both of these starting quarterbacks look good. Jimmy Garoppolo, 10 for 12, 136 yards, a touchdown, and a pick. Deshaun Watson, 5 for 8, 73 yards, and a touchdown. The Buccaneers defeat the Titans 30 to 14. Jameis Winston looked pretty good for Tampa Bay. 13 for 18. 226 yards and two touchdowns. Ryan Fitzpatrick, 5 for 13, 46 yards. Fitzpatrick will start opening day with Winston being suspended. Marcus Mariota, 4 for 7, 80 yards and a touchdown. Blaine Gappert, 10 for 16, 116 yards and a touchdown. The Bears defeat the Broncos 24 23. Mitch Trubisky, 9 for 14, 90 yards, a touchdown, and a pick. Case Keenum, 8 for 13, 78 yards. Paxton Lynch, 5 for 11, 39 yards. Chad Kelly looked very good, 7 for 9, 90 yards, and a touchdown. I'm interested to see if Kelly ends up beating out Paxton Lynch for the backup quarterback job and perhaps be the future quarterback for the Denver Broncos. Kelly's had a nice preseason. The Chargers feed the Seahawks 24 to 14. Both of these starting quarterbacks look good. Russell Wilson, 13 for 21, 193 yards. Phillip Rivers, 6 for 7 with 62 yards. Geno Smith, 6 for 8, 85 yards and a touchdown. Cardell Jones, 3 for 4, 27 yards. He showed some rushing things as well. Rushed for 41 yards. I'm talking about Jones. Adrian Peterson. Signed with the Washington Redskins today on a one-year deal. 
in wake of their rookie star running back being hurt with the torn ACL. And I'm talking about Darius Geis. And I'm curious to see if Peterson will end up being in Washington the whole season. Don't forget last year he was a member of the New Orleans Saints. And ironically enough, his first game as a Saint was in Minnesota, in which the Saints lost. And then the Saints get rid of Adrian Peterson, and then they take off last year. So there's a little bit of Ewing theory there with Adrian Peterson as the Saints took off after they traded him to the Cardinals. And the Cardinals went 8-8 eight and eight last year. So I'm interested to see if Adrian Peterson is a quote-unquote cancer or if he, or was he really a Ewing Theory candidate with the Saints last year when they removed him, they automatically become better. And the reason why I say it's a Ewing Theory, the Ringers' Bill Simmons came up with that and he called it the Ewing Theory because the 1999 eight-seeded New York Knicks lose Patrick Ewing in the playoffs against the Miami Heat, and then the Knicks then play a lot better after he gets hurt, and they go on a magical run to the NBA Finals, in which they lost to the upstart at the time, San Antonio Spurs, back when Tim Duncan, I believe he was a rookie back then, and David Robinson was still in his prime. So Adrian Peterson, I think, is a nice... Risk signing by the Washington Redskins. Before I get to my activity, I want to go over to eight people for college football real quick. That came out today. I'm very interested to see how these rankings played out. I have not seen the full list yet, and here it is. Number one is the Alabama Crimson Tide. No surprise there. Two, Clemson Tigers, no surprise there either. Three, Georgia Bulldogs. I think that's a deserving ranking. Four, this is a surprise to me, the Wisconsin Badgers. Five, the Ohio State Buckeyes. I wonder if Ohio State got punished due to the Urban Meyer situation, which bumped them down a couple spots because you would have thought that Ohio State would have been three, Georgia would have been four, and Wisconsin had a case for number five. Six is the Washington Huskies. That feels right for them. Seven, Oklahoma Sooners. Eight, Miami Hurricanes. Nine, Auburn Tigers. Eleven, Penn State Nittany Lions. Eleven, Michigan State Wolverines. Twelve, Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Thirteen, the Stanford Cardinal. Fourteen, Michigan Wolverines. Fifteen, USC Trojans. Sixteen, TCU Horned Frogs. Seventeen, West Virginia Mountaineers. Eighteen, Mississippi State Bulldogs. Nine, Florida State Seminoles. Twenty, Virginia Tech Hokies. Twenty-one, the UCF Knights, 22, Boise State Broncos, 23, the Texas Longhorns, 24, Oregon Ducks, 25, the LSU Tigers. Others receiving votes, South Carolina, Florida, Utah, Oklahoma State, Florida Atlantic, Arizona, NC State, Texas A&M, Boston College, Northwestern, Kansas State, Iowa State, Houston, Memphis, Iowa, Troy, Fresno State, Arkansas State, and Kentucky. I have some thoughts on this. And I'm going to compare them to my power rankings that I had on my podcast on Thursday last week. I think that a lot of these teams are ranked pretty much where I thought. I think Michigan's a couple spots too low. Stanford is right kind of where it should be. USC too. West Virginia. I had them at 18. They're 17 in the AP poll. Texas is much lower than I expected. I have them at 20. I thought they'd be higher than 23. LSU is a team that I had 26, but they had 25. I have Florida State at 25. They have them 19, so I think the Seminoles are a little bit too high. I think the Oklahoma State Cowboys got snubbed. I think that they should have been in that 25 range. Good for UCF getting ranked. I think that's just out of respect because of last year and how last year went for them. But I still think they're a good team, and I have them at 31 on my board. 
I have Michigan State 15. They have them 11, so I think they're a little overranked. Miami's right where they should be. I had Auburn 11. They have them 9. The ironic thing about this is that we have the exact same top 8, but we differ. I have Penn State 9. They have Penn State 10. They have Auburn 9. I have Auburn 11. I have Michigan in my top 10. They don't. That's where we differ. They have Boise State in their rankings too, as do I. I think Boise State is the top group of five team coming into the season. But they certainly think that it's going to be UCF, although Boise State was only 20 points back of them in the poll. Now I'm going to do something that I couldn't wait to do on this podcast, and that is guess the lines. I'm going to be doing a Guess the Line segment every Monday on the podcast between now and the Super Bowl for football purposes, both for college and for the NFL. College football begins this weekend, ironically enough. There are four games all taking place on Saturday. I'll make picks for those games on Friday's podcast. The four games are at 5.30. You have DeKesney at UMass. There's obviously not going to be a line showed for that game because Duquesne is an FCS team. And my guess for how that line would be is UMass giving 26.5 points to Duquesne. I don't know where those lines are, but those lines usually come out at the last minute somehow. And at 7 o'clock on Saturday, a Prairie View at Rice. Rice is going to be awful but they should be able to be an FCS school. I think they'll be giving 20 to Prairie View. And the first real game on Saturday night at 7.30 on CBS Sportsnet is Hawaii at Colorado State. I think Colorado State will be giving 14.5 points, and Colorado State is actually giving 14 points. So I'm a half point off on that pick. And then you have Wyoming at New Mexico State. My guess is that Wyoming will be giving six points to New Mexico State, although I do like New Mexico State a lot this year. I think Wyoming takes a step back. I think people are a little too high on Wyoming. I had New Mexico State's coach ranked pretty high in my coach rankings, as well as Wyoming's coach. Craig Bull is a good football coach. And so is Doug Martin. And I think that Bulls team will be giving six points at New Mexico State. And Wyoming is giving three and a half at New Mexico State. So I guess the odds makers are high on the Aggies and rightfully so. So on that guess... I was two and a half points off. So that is a little bit of a preview of what I'm going to do with college and the NFL this season. And that's it for today's podcast. I'll be back tomorrow recapping today's baseball action, looking ahead to tomorrow's action. And I'll be doing another fun activity. I'll be doing the NFL radio announcer rankings. And I'm going to do this not to insult some of the announcers that are ranked low. This is just my opinion on how I think they call games and with their enthusiasm and whether they're biased or not and whether they just flat out enjoy calling a game no matter who the opponent is like some announcers do and whatnot. And then on Wednesday's podcast, I will be ranking the NFL TV announcers, both regional and national announcers, 
Thursday, I'm going to be doing my college football predictions podcast. Friday, I'm going to make my picks for those four games, my official picks. Sunday on the 26th, I'll be recapping those games. On Saturday the 25th is to be determined. And next week's plans are to be determined as well. I hope you guys have a great day, everybody.